Well, we are nearing the end of the month of March, inching ever closer to spring planting time in the U.S. How is that weather forecast shaping up here for the final full week of the month of March? Let's talk about it and get an update from Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions joining us for our weekly weather update. And Eric, hope you had a great weekend. More severe weather in some parts of the country and really uh, this entire month, I just feel like we've been hearing a lot of severe weather reports here and snows and blizzards too, but a, a lot of severe weather in many parts of the country, Eric. Yeah, it's been a really active March and it's been an extremely windy March on top of that, right? We've seen just multiple days of very, very high winds. And thankfully this upcoming week, that all calms down a little bit. It's not nearly as windy as it has been, but it's kind of interesting. I did look at some data last week that showed that since, uh, you know, look back to 1940, okay? <clears throat> we had this interesting pattern in the, in the spring winds. It was very windy in the 40s and 50s and 60s. It was interesting, kind of calmed down in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> but since the 80s, we've been on this upward trend back to where it was in the 40s. So if you say, well, is it windier than ever? No, it was this windy, you know, but but post-World War II was the last time we saw it this windy in the Midwestern United States. So that's one thing to think about. But severe weather is another. We've had a tremendous amount of it. And just since the last time you and I talked, we saw two big outbreaks of severe weather. And even this weekend, through parts of the Mid-South and Southeast, we saw some strong storms, a lot of hailers this weekend there. Uh, but it's it's really more about where it's not been right? We, we've seen dryness creep into Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas in a big, big, big way. It's st still on the drought monitor in the north interior of the United States. And we're currently at 44% of the lower 48 in some form of drought versus a year ago, which was 21%. So this just has us all thinking, how does the rest of spring play out? And, and, and where is the rain and where is it not? And how about more of that severe weather, which I think April's still going to keep rocking with severe weather as we go forward. Well, thinking about that, what's the new seasonal outlook shaping up to be? I know that just came out last week. Are we, you know, you mentioned April could see some more of that severe weather, but does that continue into the summer months? Yeah, so we're starting off uh, relatively mild. We have a little bit of a cool down trying to come across the Great Lakes area, but Texas is going to stay quite warm. Much of the plains is southeast going to stay quiet. Even the west is finally starting to warm up here. So when do we get cool again? Is there a risk of that? Well, always in April, there's a risk of cool, but I don't know that's going to be in the southern plains. Okay, uh, beyond that, the next 14 days, still quite dry in the southern and central plains, but Texas is expecting, southern Texas, eastern Texas is expecting to get some more rainfall. But you asked about seasonal. The new forecast models attempting to take this drought we watch build into the southwestern United States and just migrate it. I mean, honestly, the epicenter from the new CPC forecast was to put it in to, I don't know, Iowa by July, August, September. And that's not good. That is, for the first time in a long time, a central a uh, U.S. based summer drought, not a spring, not a fall, but a central U.S. summer based drought scenario getting put out there. And some of the new long range models at the same time, they're trying to hit the Western Corn Belt with dry conditions are trying to hit the Black Sea with dry conditions as well. And we don't want a supply side shock or supply side, you know, movement in the market that that's not sustained, right? We've known that forever. We want a demand side move, but it seems as though the models are attempting to give us this potential risk area uh, right in the middle part of the United States and then north of the Black Sea come midsummer. So that was the big, sur not surprise, but that was the big, you know, news event in the long range forecast that was just released after what could be a tight spring east with respect to how much rainfall we get a little bit drier farther to the west. So here we go, man. I think it's going to be another story of high volatility with weather and markets going into 2025's growing season. Well, and you mentioned you know, that, that drought in, say, Iowa, for instance, and more. Were there areas that looked more favorable in that seasonal forecast, Eric? Yeah, the farther east you go, like eastern Corn Belt looked okay. Um, the, the, the southwest monsoon might be cranking. I, I mean, I know we don't often talk about the southwest here, but if you like to buy groceries at the grocery store, you have to care about the southwestern United States. Um, Canada is a bit of a wild card. They could get those ridge running thunderstorms or they could be too close to the ridge to, to be problematic. But this also means that the West Coast may not deal with such extreme heat. So that's the real thing, right? If we get into spring and we back off on the risk of being dry in the plains and all of a sudden it rains there, lots of storms, 
That's one movement against this forecast. Secondly, if the West Coast takes on a lot of heat in June and July, it's not going to be in the Midwest. So it's going to split. Where does it go? And right now the models are pushing more of that dryness into the central U.S. rather than where it's been for the last 30 to 40 years, more often than not, which is along the Western United States. So all that being said, we also have to talk about an upcoming hurricane season too, which is confusing because the newest long range forecast for La Nina is neutral all summer, but a possible return of La Nina next fall into winter. So shoot, Jesse, we're, we will have plenty to talk about for the next 12 months. There's no shortage of content mm -hmm. on our, on your show. <laughs> Absolutely. How about South America? Let's talk there. Uh, I, I know Argentina just dropped their soybean forecast, et cetera. I mean, what are you seeing in South America? Well, Argentina went through some nasty drought early, right? Most of it was north, but it was there. Some of it was in Buenos Aires. And then it stormed like mad. I mean, big severe weather systems rolled through parts of Cordoba into Buenos Aires. Now, north of there into Brazil, we watched northeastern Brazil slide into drought for the last 45 days. But the rains moved back in there this weekend. And they're expected over the next 10 days to hit some of those dry acres. Mato Grosso is not really suffering on either side of average. They're kind of hitting all their marks, which is their biggest producing state. Keep an eye on Southern Brazil, keep an eye on Eastern Brazil. If we get into April and either of those two areas show up drier, that could peel back on the potential size of this safrina crop. But certainly right now, if you look at the forecast models, they're trying to bring rains into some dry areas, which would kind of stop the bleeding. And I do mean they've been bleeding there. Last week's NDVI values in Eastern Brazil were the lowest we have on record. So it doesn't look good from space, but a little bit of rain comes in now right ahead of pollination. That's about the perfect timing for it. Eric, any other final thoughts for us here this week? Yeah, again, I would just say, watch this La Nina. It is faded fast. But do we get the typical lingering impacts from it? Possibly. I know I don't often make La Nina out to be a big story for summer, but we do know that six and 10 times after fading La Nina, we're drier from Texas to Wisconsin, that kind of narrow corridor in the midsection of the country. We're hotter in the Northern Plains. And I'm just going to give you a year. 2006 seems to be standing out in my head as a possible analog. That wasn't necessarily a problem in the eastern Corn Belt or down south, but it was a major problem in the northern plains, western Corn Belt. And uh, it's not the strongest analog, but it's one that's floating around that we just need to keep uh, in the back of our heads. Well, and also I apologize if folks hear a babbling baby at my feet. <laughs> it's daddy daycare for a Monday morning. <laughs> so we got he just wants to talk weather. He yeah. does. We got an extra broadcaster here today. <laughs> Eric, I know if folks uh, want to stay up to date with the weather forecast, they can find it very easily. Agweather.com is the best place to start, isn't it? Yeah, head there, ag-wx.com. All of our thoughts are there, and uh, we just keep it updated all the time with new maps, new analysis, and a great place to go to get good information from Nutrient. Fantastic. Eric Snodgrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions. Always good to hear from you, my friend. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll talk to you again next week. All right. Sounds good.